Human Nature by Saeed Kub, from his book titled Pillars of Islamic Perception, translation by Muhammad Alamrani. The Quran presents a vast array of human souls, encompassing all types in their original innate nature as well as in their deviant states. It portrays them in their guidance and their misguidance, in their wisdom and folly, in their uprightness and defiance, in elevation and decline, in strength and weakness, in secrecy and openness, in individuality and collectivity, in all their various forms, shapes, situations and conditions. It comprehends all of this within an expressive scope that, if not from God, would be impossible to contain this vast multitude of types and models, circumstances and stages, and to depict them with such precision and depth that human expression could not achieve even in multiple times this expressive capacity. This approach does not present the human soul in the form of a doctrine, but as a reality conveying universal truths through individual models and presenting the constant principle through transient events. It is unique in this methodology, just as it is unique in the conclusions it reaches through it. Presenting the soul in the form of a doctrine, like any other doctrinal method, leads the writer to select from facts, observations, events and images those that align with the doctrine's direction, tending to overlook the facts, observations, events and images that oppose this doctrinal line or cannot be assimilated into it, or to strip them of their significance. Consequently, various aspects of fundamental truth are neglected. This is the human method at its core. The Quranic method, however, presents the human soul as it truly is on a comprehensive scale, because the primary focus in the presentation is the truth of the human soul in all its states, not a specific doctrine in viewing it. Man is a unique creation with a distinct entity, distinguished by the duality of his natural composition. He is a vicegerent on earth, endowed with the characteristics of this vicegerency, the foremost of which is the capacity for ever-growing and renewing knowledge. He is equipped to receive cosmic influences, react to them and respond to them. From the totality of his reactions and responses stems his dynamic activity for construction, change, modification, analysis, synthesis and development in the substance and energies of this universe emerges to fulfil the function of vicegerency. And man is a being honoured by God, possessing a great position in the design of existence. Despite all that his natural flaws and predisposition to weakness and error, deficiency and regression, yet his capacity for ascending knowledge, for bearing the trust of guidance and for bearing the responsibility for guidance or misguidance, makes him a unique being, worthy of God's honour and his appointment of him as vicegerent on earth, and makes him well deserving of his acceptance of his repentance, as well as the divine care bestowed upon him through the sending of messengers and revelations. Man is nobler than all that is material, for all that is material has been created for him. He is a being that interacts with the entire universe, with all that is within it, and all that it contains. He interacts with his sustainer as he interacts with the heavenly host of angels, with the jinn and devils, with his own diverse inclinations, with all living beings of the cosmos, with the manifest and hidden forces of the universe, and with the matter and objects of this universe. The universe is prepared to interact with him, just as he is equipped with the means to interact with the universe and with the sustainer of the universe. Endowed as he is with spirit, intellect, senses, faculties and energies that befit the duality of his composition. By his inherent inborn nature, he is capable of rising to heights surpassing those of the nearest angels just as he is equally capable of descending to levels lower than the basest of animals. This is contingent upon the effort he exerts in purifying his soul or in debasing it and the extent to which he receives aid from God, guidance and care, which is directly related to his own efforts, desires, orientations and attempts to connect with his Creator and adhere to God's methodology and guidance. Thus, he is the most wondrous being and the strangest entity 
encompassing these vastly divergent capacities. We know of no other creature that possesses these characteristics, whether angels or devils, animals or the elements of matter and their systems. Man is designed on the principle of duality, which is a universal and vital characteristic, and on the principle of complementarity between the two pairs, not similarity, another cosmic and vital characteristic. Prior to this, man is based on the harmony with the universe and proximity and material essence, with the addition of that unique element within him, the Spirit of God, an element that transcends mere animal life. This element has charted a distinctive path recognized for its uniqueness even by the proponents of Darwinian theory. The supreme bond that unites the individuals of this being is faith, for it is the element related to his unique aspect, the element that made him human and defined his special path. Hence, the Islamic conception aligns with this profound and intricate structure, revealing the cohesive synthesis in its overall vision. All other bonds and ties, including those of blood, language, race, neighbourhood and economic interests, become nullified or inactive if this primary bond is disrupted or annulled. Allegiance is forbidden if this fundamental bond is severed. Islam maintains in the Muslim's conscience a sense of human brotherhood concerning feelings, personal dealings, justice and equity towards all the children of Adam and even towards living beings. However, it strongly negates any bond of allegiance and support with non-Muslims. Muslims residing in the abode of war have no allegiance from the Muslims in the abode of Islam until they migrate. Although this is a regulatory matter, the Islamic conception makes it an issue of faith and doctrine. It equates Muslims who ally themselves with Jews and Christians with those they ally with, considering it an act of apostasy from Islam as referenced in Al-Baqara, Anissa, Al-Ma'ida, Atauba, and Al-Mumtahina. The vicegerency of this being on earth is conditional and restricted by the covenant of God and his pledge that this being remains steadfast upon his guidance, methodology, and law, dedicates his worship purely to him, claims none of the attributes of divinity, and directs all his efforts for God, who appointed him as vicegerent over this vast dominion. Otherwise, his entire life faces corruption, his deeds turn void, and he subjects himself to God's punishment in this world or the hereafter or both. The paradisical reward in the hereafter in the Islamic conception is the direct consequence of reforming earthly life and excelling in the vicegerency. Reforming earthly life begins with self-improvement and culminates in the reformation of the entire community state establishing its affairs upon God's methodology. Excelling in vicegerency starts with uncovering the laws, provisions and resources God has embedded in this planet since its creation, and it concludes with utilising all these in the enhancement and elevation of life, distributing it with the justice decreed by God. When it is established that paradise is the reward for making this life paradise. It becomes evident that Islam, as both faith and way of life, stands distinct from all other beliefs and doctrines. These may either withdraw from worldly life to reach the paradise of the hereafter, denying earthly dominion to aspire to the celestial kingdom, or they may deny the celestial kingdom to cling to the earth, following their desires in life management. Thus, it is evident that the ascent in religious consciousness within Islam becomes the foremost guarantee and profound incentive for advancement in material civilization. This involves harnessing cosmic forces, faculties, provisions and resources within the divine methodology for creation and movement. The ultimate purpose of human existence, life itself, aligns with the enhancement and elevation of life. Indeed, the enhancement and elevation of life become an act of worship, the passport to the paradisical hereafter, and God's pleasure. Thus ends the story of the pathetic dichotomy between religion and life.
Within the nature of this being lies an innate need to know its Creator, to seek refuge in Him, and to acknowledge His oneness. If this nature is overclouded by desires, covered by layers of neglect, or corrupted by luxury and prolonged forgetfulness, it eventually shakes off these coverings and manifests itself as it originally emerged from its Creator. This happens particularly when faced with dangers that exceed human capacity and leave no room for human contrivance, leading the being to turn back to its sustainer, sincerely dedicating itself to him. Thus, this innate nature itself bears witness to its inherent need to know God, to acknowledge his oneness, and to seek refuge in him and submit to him. Human nature is inherently inclined towards faith, and belief is a fundamental necessity. It is as much a natural instinct as it is an intellectual need that man cannot dispense with. This inclination is embedded in his very being, and he is created with it. This truth is pointed to in the verse, And when your sustainer took from the children of Adam from their loins, their descendants. Man encounters situations in his life within this universe where he must turn to a force greater than human capacity, no matter how advanced. Such situations demand a power beyond all that is available to humanity in terms of strength and knowledge. Additionally, the very existence of this universe, with its harmony, raises questions that the human intellect cannot answer without contemplating the existence of a capable and managing deity. Islamic thought posits that human nature does not merely need the existence of a deity, but necessitates the oneness of this deity. It instinctively seeks this oneness in moments that shake its core, stripping away all pretenses and restoring it to a state of rectitude. This is true both in times of adversity and in moments of contemplation of the universe and its phenomena with the persistent existential questions it poses. The Qur'an portrays the human soul when its innate nature stands bare before the terror that surpasses its capacity, shaking its depths and removing all veils, bringing it back to clarity and uprightness, as seen in the following verses. It is he who enables you to travel on land and sea until when you are in ships and they sail with them by a good wind and they rejoice therein, there comes a storm wind and the waves come upon them from everywhere and they assume that they are surrounded, they supplicate God, sincere to him in religion. If you should save us from this, we will surely be among the thankful. But when he saves them, at once they commit injustice upon the earth without right. Yunus 22 to 23. Say, have you considered, if there came to you the punishment of God or there came to you the hour, is it other than God you would invoke if you should be truthful? No, it is him alone you would invoke, and he would remove that for which you invoked him if he willed, and you would forget what you associate with him. Alanum 40 to 41. And when adversity touches man, he calls upon us, whether lying on his side or sitting or standing, but when we remove from him his adversity, he continues as if he had never called upon us to remove an adversity that touched him. Thus is made pleasing to the transgressors that which they have been doing. Eunice 12. And when adversity touches the people, they call upon their sustainer, turning in repentance to him. Then when he lets them taste mercy from him, at once a party of them associates others with their sustainer. Our room 33. And how many cities did we destroy while they were committing wrong, so it is fallen into ruin, and how many an abandoned well and a lofty palace? So their supplication when our punishment came to them was not but that they said, Indeed, we were wrongdoers, Alara fortified. Likewise, it depicts the upright nature when confronting the universe, sensing the urgent need to interpret its existence, the meaning of this existence, and the inevitability of its creator, as illustrated in the verses. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of the night and the day, are signs for those of understanding, those who remember God while standing or sitting or lying on their sides and give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, Our Sustainer, you did not create this aimlessly, exalted are you above such a thing, 
Then protect us from the punishment of the fire. Our sustainer, indeed, whoever you admit to the fire, you have disgraced him, and for the wrongdoers there are no helpers. Our sustainer, indeed, we have heard a caller calling to faith, saying, Believe in your sustainer, and we have believed. Our sustainer, so forgive us our sins and remove from us our misdeeds and cause us to die with the righteous. 3, 190-193 and mention, when Abraham said to his father, Azar, do you take idols as deities? Indeed, I see you and your people to be in manifest error. And thus did we show Abraham the realm of the heavens and the earth, that he would be among the certain in faith. So, when the night covered him with darkness, he saw a star. He said, This is my sustainer. But when it set, he said, I like not those that disappear. And when he saw the moon rising, he said, This is my sustainer. But when it set, he said, Unless my sustainer guides me, I will surely be among the people gone astray. And when he saw the sun rising, he said, This is my sustainer, this is greater. But when it set, he said, O oh, my people, indeed I am free from what you associate with God. Indeed I have turned my face toward he who created the heavens and the earth, inclining towards truth, and I am not of those who associate others with God. And his people argued with him. He said, Do you argue with me concerning God while he has guided me? And I fear not what you associate with him, and will not be harmed, unless my sustainer should will something. My sustainer encompasses all things in knowledge. Then will you not remember? And how should I fear what you associate, while you do not fear that you have associated with God that for which he has not sent down to you any authority? So which of the two parties has more right to security, if you should know? They who believe and do not mix their belief with injustice, those will have security, and they are rightly guided. And that was our conclusive argument which we gave Abraham against his people. We raise by degrees whom we will. Indeed, your sustainer is wise and knowing. 676 to 83. In this story, Abraham points to the inner evidence he found within himself, the proof of God's existence, which he discovered and received as a sign, becoming certain of it in his innate nature. The members of this species are inherently equal in their servitude to God. Those who are favoured by God among his servants are the believers in him. The closest and highest among them are the most pious. This is the supreme value. Piety manifests both in feelings and rituals, as well as in actions and movement. The references to piety in the Quran indicate its encompassing role in all aspects of life and human activity. It is most frequently mentioned in contexts of interaction, movement, activity and stewardship. Thus, it is a universal and constant value by which individuals are measured in the sight of God. Indeed, the most honoured of you in the sight of God is the most pious. The human experience on this earth is marked by a continuous series of trials. Life and death, prosperity and adversity, health and illness, strength and weakness, victory and defeat, abundance and scarcity, wealth and poverty. Each reaction to these trials is judged by how well it aligns with the divine guidance revealed to us. The recompense for our actions, whether in this life, the hereafter, or both, is an inevitable truth that shall come to pass. Within the bounds of divine will, human beings play an active role in shaping their destiny. This encompasses both their personal lives and their broader circumstances, including their wealth and surroundings. The relationship between human actions and divine decree rests on the principle that no one will suffer injustice. Despite the complexities of this interaction, what remains clear is that positive effort and absolute justice govern the outcomes, whether in this world or the hereafter. The individual soul is accountable for its deeds and receives its due recompense. This journey extends beyond death, originating from the realm of primordial souls and continuing to the eternal abode. The soul prepares itself through its earthly deeds for either a life in paradise or a life in hell. In, in this world, 
the believer rises to become an instrument of God's decree, fulfilling his will through personal effort in themselves and their surroundings. Through this alignment, manifestations of divine power emerge from their actions. This phenomenon is not limited to prophetic miracles. It is a state attainable by any Muslim preparing them for the life of paradise. Extraordinary transformations in the self and in human affairs arise from this readiness to embody God's decree. The believer must submit entirely, embracing peace, implementing God's commands and conveying his message openly. They must strive to realize God's laws of stewardship, endeavor to establish his sovereignty and divinity, for only his guidance can save and bring them closer to their sustainer. To convey and strive for God's law on earth, the believer is commanded to be loyal to God, his messenger and the believers, and to be disloyal to Satan, tyrants and disbelievers. At this point, God's promises of success, victory and empowerment. All spiritual and angelic forces will support them, and God's promise is assured. God has decreed, I and my messengers will surely prevail. Verily, those who follow God, his messenger, and the believers, they are the party of God who will be victorious. The Quran portrays humanity in various states and scenarios, underscoring the value of faith in shaping responses and preparedness. A person is at their best and most upright when in a state of faith, producing good for themselves and their stewardship. Conversely, they are at their worst and most disordered when deviating from their natural axis and cosmic orbit, leading to personal and widespread corruption. The struggle between the individual and Satan is depicted as the primary and ultimate battle, encompassing all aspects of one's being and surroundings. The individual is equipped with the tools to win this battle, failing only if they neglect these tools. However, if they forget and then remember, they will regain their strength and ensure victory in this struggle. The humanity of the prophets is a foundational element of faith, embodying the honor of the entire human species contrary to the assumptions of paganism and ignorance. All prophets came with a unified message. The components of faith include belief in God, his angels, his books, his messengers, the last day, and the divine decree, both good and evil. Human characteristics, energies, and capabilities are designed for their role in stewardship on earth. These are measured according to this role with potential both vast and limited by its requirements. They are endowed with these qualities in abundance, supported by divine aid and care. Matters beyond this role, such as the unseen and the appointed time, remain concealed, with certainty coming only from God. Everything else is speculative and uncertain. The human soul possesses inherent potential for both good and evil. Through individual and collective actions, these potentials are realized. Therefore, the Islamic way necessitates establishing a virtuous center that fosters the growth of virtues and curbs vices. This ensures that inclinations towards good become the norm, while inclinations towards evil are restrained, becoming the exception. Humanity operates within a broad spectrum. One may ascend to heights surpassing even the angels or descend to levels lower than beasts. Human history is a series of ascensions and dissensions, not a single unbroken upward trajectory. While scientific knowledge and material experiences may appear to follow an ascending path, human nature does not. It aligns with its most accurate state of submission to God and liberation from servitude to other beings or deviates from this proper state. The Quran states, we have certainly created man in the best of stature. Then we return him to the lowest of the low, except for those who believe and do righteous deeds. The immutable divine law empowers God's righteous servants on earth who adhere to his guidance and brings destruction upon his enemies who oppose his way. This may take time relative to the brief span of human life, but the divine law never fails, 
Historical evidence, both Quranic and secular, affirms this truth, a fundamental principle in the Islamic interpretation of history. Islam accommodates a vast array of models and types within its framework, promoting harmony and compatibility among them so that they coexist with minimal friction and contradiction. When we review the various personalities, natures, talents and directions that thrived during the early period, we marvel at their diversity, richness and the remarkable coherence they exhibited. Figures like Abu Bakr and Umar, Abu Dar and Amr ibn al-As, Khalid ibn al-Walid and Juwaybir, among others with their distinct natures and models, thrived within this belief system, cooperating in a uniquely splendid manner. Islam permits differences in human temperaments and modes of action within its scope. Principles and foundations are fixed and obligatory, while the methods and forms of practical life are flexible and diverse. However, this flexibility does not imply a separation of means from principles or forms from rules. The fundamental principle is that human existence is based on absolute servitude to God and rejection of false deities. The principle is the purity and cleanliness of the means, just as the goal is pure and clean. The Islamic perspective shares profound connections with human nature and elicits numerous responses. Servitude to God meets the innate need for a deity, as discussed in paragraph 13. The unseen meets the innate need for the unknown, encompassing it wherever it turns, and responds to the innate desire to transcend sensory constraints, guiding humanity to its unique characteristics. The hereafter meets the innate need for absolute justice and enduring existence, representing the natural culmination befitting an excellent creation like humanity, extending their being and culminating in the level of paradise as they ascend towards that noble horizon. Acknowledging the purity of human capacities and providing them with space to operate without repressing any innate faculty under the pretext of impurity or filth particularly the faculties of procreation and extension, contrary to the approaches of institutional Christianity, Buddhism and pessimistic philosophies. Even the limitations imposed by Islam are rooted in human nature itself. When it restricts human capacities to prevent excess, it safeguards them from damage and deterioration, aligning with and fulfilling human nature. In the Islamic view, there exists no concept of inherited sin. Instead, each individual is responsible for their own actions, sin and repentance, with the door of repentance perpetually open. The Christian notion of inherited sin, symbolized by the act of eating from the tree, and often interpreted as a metaphor for sexual indulgence, does not align with Islamic principles. In Islam, Sexual relations are seen as a natural function essential for the continuity and elevation of life, as well as for fulfilling the role of stewardship on earth. This function is safeguarded by divine guarantees and guided by a path that ensures its purity and goodness, avoiding both repression and excess. The fundamental values that Islam seeks to establish in society are protected by the highest penalties to preserve communal life. These values encompass the punishment of apostates, murderers, adulterers, corruptors, thieves, those who consume alcohol, and usurers. These represent the boundaries that Islam aims to guard in life. These penalties are decreed by God, leaving no room for negotiation or objection, as challenging God's decrees equates to disbelief in his divinity, leading to apostasy from the entire religion. God, exalted and glorified, has taken upon himself the task of defining the fundamental vision of existence for humankind. This vision is what the believer engages with, both in relation to God and the universe surrounding him, encompassing the realms of the unseen and the seen, including both living beings and inanimate objects. The role of human reason is to receive this foundational vision from the original source, brought forth by the prophet, peace be upon him, and not from any other source. Similarly, human reason is to grasp the fundamental principles or components that form this vision or emerge from it. 
After receiving these principles, the task of reason is to apply them to the diverse and ever-changing situations that cannot be exhaustively listed, continuing until the end of human life. It is not the role of reason, decisively and definitively, to establish the fundamental tenets of Islamic thought or its core principles, nor to alter or amend them. Those who argue that Islam addresses the intellect and does not ignore or coerce it with material miracles, thus allowing human reason to autonomously determine matters of faith and foundational principles, are indeed mixing truth with falsehood and exceeding the natural limits and scope of human reason. Those who perceive the role of faith as merely regulating and correcting human reason, allowing it then to make decisions on all matters, misunderstand the nature of faith in Islam. Islam is the only religion accepted by God as stated in the Quran. Indeed, the religion in the sight of God is Islam, and whoever seeks a religion other than Islam, it will never be accepted from him. Faith encompasses the declaration of all fundamental aspects of the vision and the core principles governing human life, including the Sharia that addresses both foundational laws and many applications. Acceptance of Sharia as the sole source for regulating human life and rejection of all other sources is integral to faith. It is the essence of faith. There is no room for exceeding the boundaries of human reason in Islamic thought, whether in its doctrinal form or its practical implications. In a state of equilibrium, a human performs all activities in accordance with his nature. He is most balanced when responding to all calls of his innate nature, including those of faith and conviction. If he deviates from this balance, he engages in activities in a manner akin to that of animals. As the Quran says, those who disbelieve enjoy themselves and eat like cattle eat. Despite the apparent similarities between some human and animal processes, such as digestion, metabolism, heat production, oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide expulsion, the fundamental difference between a human in his natural state and an animal lies in the motivations accompanying emotions, perceptions and the nature of the energy expended. A human only resembles an animal in the act of eating when he strays from the natural balance through disbelief and neglect of his true nature. In this role of vicegerency, at this level, and within these boundaries, humans interact with the entirety of existence, starting with the creator of existence. They interact with God, exalted and glorified, with the angels, with the devils, with all living beings on this earth, both plant and animal, and with the material universe as well as with the entire realm of the unseen alongside the visible world. To interact with all these realms and fulfill their function and purpose, humans require a special formation capable of engaging with these dimensions in every direction. Thus, we understand the essence of humanity through the comprehension of its function and ultimate purpose. In the Islamic perspective, what unites or divides people is the doctrine. Unity on a matter that an individual can willingly adopt is the primary bond from which all other bonds emanate. It pertains to the distinctive attribute that defines a human being, the breath of God's Spirit which sets humanity apart from all other creatures and makes it deserving of this doctrine. From this primary bond all other bonds are derived, thus the family is initially established upon it and the ties of kinship are drawn from it. Similarly, the bond of the nation is formed. In Islamic terminology, the nation refers to the community of believers in this doctrine across all lands and times. Generations of believers across the earth constitute the lineage of the Muslim nation, where kinship ties, tribal affiliations or territorial connections do not alone form the basis of the nation without the bond of doctrine. It is crucial to distinguish this fundamental consideration from the Islamic directives for general mercy towards all people, kindness to them and justice even in hostility. This is one matter, and the allegiance that binds the Muslim nation is another. This allegiance is specific and confined to the Muslim nation, to the extent that it may sever ties between this nation and Muslims remaining in the abode of disbelief if they are able to join the Muslim nation in the abode of Islam. The abode of Islam is any land governed by the laws of God, 
while the abode of disbelief is any land ruled by laws other than those of God. If a group of Muslims remains in the land of disbelief and war, and they are able to join the Muslim nation, no allegiance exists between this distant group and the Muslim nation. And those who believed but did not migrate, you have no claim to their allegiance until they migrate. Thus, we must differentiate between the concept of the nation in Islamic thought and the directives for general mercy towards humanity, kindness to them, as long as they do not oppose God and his messenger, and justice even against enmity. These are the responsibilities of the Muslim nation towards all of humanity, as the Muslim nation is to be the dominant force that establishes justice among people in every situation, shows mercy, and acts kindly unless wronged. Mercy and kindness to humanity are manifested in guiding them to this religion and adhering to this righteous vision. One should not use this Islamic mandate for the Muslim nation as a means to dilute Islamic considerations, such as establishing allegiance solely based on doctrine and considering doctrine as the primary and fundamental basis of the nation, while prohibiting allegiance between this nation and those who differ in belief. Allegiance is one thing, and mercy, kindness, and justice are another. They should not be confused. Islam, with all its exaltedness, purity, and morality, derived from its divine essence, does not stray from reality in its conception of human nature. It recognizes this human being who lives on the surface of this earth with his innate abilities, capacities, and weaknesses. Islam does not diminish this being or belittle his positive role on earth and in the cycle of life. It does not disregard his value in any aspect of his life, whether as an individual or as a member of a community. Nor does it assume that all his inherent motives are superficial, easily altered by a mere stroke of a pen or by changing his social status through legal force. Specifically, it does not fall into the distortion of Marxism, which believes that by merely dismantling bourgeois classes, and establishing a dictatorship of the proletariat, individuals will transform into pure, virtuous beings, working to their fullest potential and consuming according to their needs without the need for government management and distribution. In the Islamic perspective, the human being is this very entity who treads upon the earth with his profound individuality and deep collectivity, with individual motivations that must be acknowledged and fulfilled, and collective motivations that must also be recognized and addressed. He is a being with a complex, mixed and diverse nature, combining physical, mental and spiritual capacities that are inseparable and require attention. These elements must be considered and fulfilled, taking into account the profound differences between him and machines or animals. From this understanding, Islam elevates the individual to the highest levels of human potential according to his formation, respecting his nature and unique essence, and providing guidelines that address him as an individual, as a member of a community, and as this dual, mixed and complex being. Recognizing humanity from all these angles and applying a methodology that considers this complete humanity, Islam has managed at various points in history to elevate people to levels never before achieved by humanity. It has crafted models that humanity aspires to in all generations and has achieved a practical model of life characterized by values and individual and collective visions deeply rooted in personal conscience and realistic social relations unmatched by any other. The station granted to humanity by God, as understood through the Islamic perspective, reveals the domain within which humans operate, where their personality, existence and efficacy manifest. This domain encompasses their interactions with a variety of realms, with God the majestic, with the celestial host of the angels, with the world of jinn and devils, with the observable universe and with all living beings upon this earth. It includes the vicegerency of the earth and the interaction through this vicegerency with all these realms extending from the earth to the heavens, from this world to the hereafter. This esteemed position, 
highlighted by these indications, is not granted by the philosophies of the Enlightenment, which deified humanity, nor by the Magna Carta, the principles of the French Revolution, or the Declaration of Human Rights. None of these have conferred upon humanity what God has granted, except as a guise to obscure the divine sovereignty of God. They have given nothing but that which corrupts and diminishes human nature, by depriving it of its innate need for servitude to God. This servitude bestows upon humanity this vast domain, and grants it this noble space in the presence of God. The theory of knowledge, over which philosophies have waged a jubilant war for three centuries, with the joy now gone, and only the conflict remaining, as Durant puts it, is elucidated in the Quran with radiant, profound, and precise clarity. No vision can grasp him, but he grasps all vision. He is the subtle, the acquainted. Indeed, there has come to you enlightenment from your sustainer. So whoever sees it is for himself, and whoever is blind is to his own detriment. And I am not a guardian over you. And similarly we repeat the signs so they may say, You have studied, and so we may make the explanations clear for people who know. Follow what has been revealed to you from your sustainer. There is no deity except him, and turn away from those who associate others with God. If God had willed, they would not have associated others with him and we have not made you a guardian over them, nor are you a disposer of their affairs, and do not insult those they invoke other than God, lest they insult God in hostility without knowledge. Thus we have adorned for every people its deed. Then to their sustainer is their return, and he will inform them about what they used to do. And they swore by God their strongest oaths that if a sign came to them they would surely believe in it. Say, the signs are with God alone, and what will make you perceive that even if they came, they would not believe, and we will turn their hearts and their eyes just as they did not believe in it the first time, and we will leave them in their transgression wandering blindly, and if we had sent down to them, the angels and the dead had spoken to them, and we had gathered together everything before them, they would not have believed unless God willed, but most of them are ignorant, and thus we have made for every prophet an enemy, devils from among men and jinn, inspiring one another with deceptive speech adorned with delusion. And if your sustainer had willed, they would not have done it. So leave them and that which they invent, and let the hearts of those who do not believe in the hereafter incline toward it, and let them be pleased with it, and let them commit what they are committing. Is there any judge other than God, while he is the one who has sent down to you the book detailed? And those to whom we have given the scripture know that it is sent down from your sustainer in truth. So never be among the doubters. And the word of your sustainer has been fulfilled in truth and justice. There is none who can alter his words, and he is the hearing, the knowing. And if you obey most of those on the earth, they will mislead you from the way of God. They follow nothing but conjecture, and they are not but falsifiers. Your sustainer knows best who strays from his way, and he knows best who are guided. Quran, chapter 6, verses 103 to 107.